honorable members, thank you very much. And thank you for your patience. Uh, it has been stretched. Our patience has been stretched to the limit. But one thing you should always keep in your minds as you raise your hands, raising your points of order, is that the person who sits here has a responsibility to protect parliament, has a responsibility to follow every rule to the latter, to its finality. Every day, the Speaker of Parliament signs documents to defend Parliament from being litigated. So please bear with me. Thank you. <laughs> Honorable members, order. Mr. President, our sincere apologies. Apologies first for the chair, the, the bank you are sitting on. And, and it's quite hard. Our sincere apologies, but also for your patience. Please bear with us. This is how it is in Parliament. And this is all we could do to make sure that you respond to the issues people of South Africa have raised with you yesterday. Thank you very much. <laughs> I, I, I know that I'm uh, in a very dangerous position between yourself, uh, your lunch, and uh, this speech. And the planes, I, and the I planes know people, as well. people are wanting to leave. Indeed, Thank indeed. You. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Let's speak of the National Assembly and Deputy President uh, David Mabuza, ministers and deputy ministers and honorable members. Fourteen is the number of times I have appeared in this parliament since 2018 to answer oral questions put by members of this house and may I say also the NCOP. As Deputy President between 2014 and 2017 I appeared 22 times in this house. 84 is the number of oral questions I have replied to this parliament between 2018 and the 1st of June this year out of 84 submitted to the presidency. Now, as deputy president, the number was 114 out of 114 questions submitted. Those were all answered. 150 59 is the number of questions for written reply answered by this president since 2018 out of 160 questions submitted. One left. Three full days is the number of times I, as the sitting head of state, which in a number of places is unheard of, to have testified at two major commissions of inquiry since 2018. Other heads of states never submitted themselves to that level of inquiry. And when I've even told them I'm going, some of them ask me, what is this? Why should you as head of state even begin <clears throat> to subject yourself to such a process? The first being in August 2020 at the Commission of Inquiry into Allegations of State Capture and the second in April 2022 at the South African Human Rights Commission hearings in the July 2021 uprising or unrest. This, honorable members, is the track record of this president in meeting obligations to be accountable. This is the evidence of this president, as well as my commitment to account to parliament and to the people of South Africa. Because we are a government elected by the people, 
for the people and we are accountable to the people of South Africa for all that we do. As I said yesterday, the people of our country must come first in all that we do. As public representatives, we are elected on the promise to improve the lives of our people and we are obliged to keep that promise. It is the reason for this par government and this parliament's existence as well. So before I get to this foremost priority, I want to reassure and indeed remind this house that accountability is a responsibility I have never shirked away from or shied away from. When I was elected, I promised that I would come to this house regularly and answer your questions, and I have done so faithfully. At times, there may well have been problems with programming, but I've always said, if I don't come now, I'll come at a later stage. The robbery that took place at my farm in 2020 is a subject of criminal complaint, and the law must be allowed to take its course. In other words, due process must be followed. I have listened, Madam Speaker, very carefully to the views of a number of members of this House who have raised thoughts, suggestions, and proposals on this matter. Some of the views have been to counsel me, and yet others have been laced with insults. I will not respond to insults. I should, however, say that the counsel and suggestions that have been made raises points that indeed I should consider in the face of the advice I have that I should not be responding to speculation conjecture, allegations, or even so-called revelations. I will give all these matters consideration against the backdrop of the advice I have that this matter should be ventilated in the proper and appropriate forums. And I repeat that the law must take its course and due process should be the order of the day in this. And as a result, I will not right now be responding to all these matters that have been raised around this. Counsel that has been put forward, I will get put under consideration. Honorable members, the presidency occupies a unique place in government. It is indeed the front office of government and represents South Africa on the world stage, on our continent, and in a number of international forums. The presidency coordinates the functions of state departments and administrations, as opposed to other government departments that are tasked with implementing national policy and legislation that derives from this parliament. Above all, the presidency and the president is the custodian of the constitution and is a duty bound, the president is duty bound to uphold, defend, and protect the constitution as the supreme law of our country. For all these functions to be fulfilled and the respective responsibilities to be met, the presidency must both build and lead a capable, ethical, and developmental state. We therefore welcome the inputs that have been made during this debate, but the disruptions that we have witnessed, we welcome the thoughts, the ideas, also on the support that Parliament will render to the Presidency to enable it to better fulfill its mandate. The recent meeting between the presidency and the political parties, which was initiated, as I said, by General Bantu Holomisa, 
on the issue of crime and security situation is an example of the way in which we can harness the energies, the thoughts of this parliament to address the most pressing problems our society faces. The finest example, however, is the regular engagements between the presidency and parties represented in this parliament at the onset of COVID-19 in 2020. That very first meeting in March of 2020 set the tone for the cooperation that would follow. The United Front, presented by political parties and their rallying behind the national response, gave reassurance and confidence to a fearful and terrified and uncertain population at the time it was most needed. It was the combined effort of the parties represented here that made our people feel confident that we as a nation can address COVID-19, which many other countries were failing to address effectively. In the ensuing months, more engagements and consultations would follow around the lockdown and other measures. These consultations were meaningful, they were deep and effective. As much as some political parties had different perspectives from those of the government, we were, however, united in our determination to deal with COVID-19 to save lives and protect the livelihoods of our people. We can say with certainty that this strong collaboration and partnership played no small part in the success of our national response to the pandemic. It was a joy to see leaders of political parties going out to their constituencies, encouraging them to take up the measures that had been proposed, washing hands, wearing masks, and when vaccination process started, they were out there leading the charge. And we are grateful for that level of cooperation and one wishes it can continue as we tackle the more challenging aspects of our lives. This is what social compacting is all about. It is about cooperation, building trust, and forging consensus. It is about building and nurturing spaces in which all voices and viewpoints are heard and considered. It doesn't only refer to government or business and labor, but all of society. And as political parties, you are elected representatives of the people of this country. You are here to speak for them and represent their interests. This debate has drawn attention to what I yesterday termed the real bread and butter issues our people are preoccupied with. That is what they want to hear us talk about. As the Honorable Heron rightly put it, our priority at this time is to achieve a just and prosperous South Africa based on special social, economic, and environmental justice. In my reply to last year's presidency budget vote, I said that we were determined to stay the course on our reform program in order to restore our economy, to attract new levels of investment, to create massive jobs, to boost wages and increase opportunities for all South Africans. Yesterday I outlined the process we've made not only as the presidency, but as a country in meeting these goals. This framing was deliberate and conscious. Honorable Mbele, you may well have dismissed what we said as an update and update and so forth. What we were talking about is real. These are initiatives that are underway to restructure our economy, to reboot it, so that it becomes an economy that can respond to the needs of our people. 
In line with its coordinating role, the presidency is driving the reform process from the center. Some honorable members have described the process as of coordination through the presidency as creating what they call a super presidency and is an over centralization of power. Far from it. We have found that this work that we are involved in is particularly in this era is about strengthening the capacity of the state. It's about addressing that priority that we've often highlighted. We are helping to streamline and align government functions, assisting to manage and mitigate bureaucratic hurdles and fulfilling our critical oversight role. The National Development Plan lays out our vision for South Africa, and that vision is still current. However, we must say that at its heart, it is about eliminating poverty and reducing inequality. The enablers of this vision are an inclusive and transformed economy, an enhanced state capacity, and partnerships right across society. In recent times, a number of reports and studies have indicated that, yes, we may and will not meet our 2030 targets under the NDP. Because the problems that we have had to deal with are immense. But this should not stop us from trying, from doing as much as we can to try to meet those, some of those targets. We must ensure that the NDP is implemented, as the Honorable Jafta has emphasized. We further thank the Honorable Jafta for acknowledging the strides that have been made in reviving our economy through the investment drive that we have embarked upon through the conferences that we've been holding, the Youth Employment Service, and various other initiatives. In these intervening years, we have to redouble our efforts and, may I say, even work harder. Because as elected representatives, we have an obligation to improve the material conditions of every South African man, woman, and child. We have positioned ourselves as a transformative administration. And transformation takes time. It does not happen overnight. But when the right decisions are made at the right time, guided by the right course of action based on good policies, progress results. Most importantly, the foundations upon which an, any economic recovery is built have to be solid, they have to be coherent, and they also have to be catalytic and in a way also disruptive. In the presidency budget vote last year, I outlined key economic reform measures that were underway or were in process, driven by Operation Bulindela. The majority of these have subsequently been passed, including those that I highlighted yesterday in transportation, electricity, energy, telecoms, and water infrastructure. This year, through Operation Volintlela, supported by the Project Management Office in the Presidency and the Red Tape Reduction Team, we aim to deliver even more. Security of energy supply has had a direct material impact on domestic and international investor confidence, which in turn leads to a favorable business environment that creates more jobs. That is why supporting the process of structural reform in the energy sector has been one of our most overriding priorities in the presidency. The energy reform process is aimed at, in part at addressing our immediate challenges. Whoever anyone meets about investment and growing the economy they always raise the issue of energy. Yesterday, I outlined progress, the renewable energy procurement program, the conclusion of power purchase agreements for three risk mitigation projects and measures 
that we will be taking to close the electricity gap. But the ultimate objective is to fundamentally transform the energy landscape, create a new competitive electricity market, and most importantly, decarbonize our economy. For this reason, the Just Transition Partnership with the new Climate Finance Office in the Presidency will be mobilizing resources and will be a game changer. This is the work being undertaken as we are committed to transformative, inclusive, and sustainable development. Two years ago, the presidency set its transformative sides on the labor market. It was at a time when the private sector job creation was constrained and hampered by the pandemic, and many livelihoods were in danger or had been lost. Working with social partners and government departments, we designed a brand new way of addressing this challenge that we were facing. And we've been driving the implementation of the largest mass public employment program in our country's history. And many people have never really noticed. For the very first time in our country, we were able, within a short space of time, to get to a point where we created 900,000 job opportunities for a number of young people and women. And that in itself is something that we should recognize. To date, this employment stimulus has successfully provided work opportunities to all those people who are beneficiaries, who would otherwise not have been absorbed by the constrained job market. Companies were not employing people. In fact, they were shedding jobs. And we had this cohort of young people, as well as women, who were twiddling their thumbs, who needed to be absorbed into some measure of economic activity. We know, Honorable Mbele, that it is our youth who are suffering most from unemployment and exclusion. That is why the majority of the close on to almost one million beneficiaries of this groundbreaking program have been young people, as I said, and to be exact, 84% of them have been young people and 62% female. The second phase is supporting the Presidential Youth Employment Intervention and the Social Employment Fund that we've just set up, where we also expect young people to be the primary beneficiaries. The presidency has been championing the drive to transform the capacity of the state. Our vision is to realize the state that is fit for purpose to serve communities, and that brings targeted and inclusive development to where people live, study, and work. Now, the district development model is an initiative that we came up with and which was launched at, pilot, at a pilot site in O.R. Tambo District in 2020. Although the onset of the pandemic set our efforts to roll out the district development model back, the process has resumed in earnest. As part of operationalizing this model, the Department of Cooperative Governance and Traditional Affairs has been working with districts and municipalities to finalize their one plans. And these one plans outline the respective approaches of districts to resolve service delivery challenges, to enhance economic development, and to, to ensure that there is job creation and key deliverables. Now, this presidential inviso have been a means through which the presidency exercises oversight over the progress that is being made. And as I said yesterday, we plan to visit six more remaining provinces. And Honorable Hendricks has expressed a wish that the inviso in the Western Cape should be held on the Cape Flats. And Honorable Hendricks, your request will be given serious consideration. I would like us to be here in the Western Cape. Because this will be an opportunity 
to listen to the life experiences of our people and their concerns in the Western Cape. And no doubt such an MBZO will bring in people from a number of surrounding areas where our people live. District-based development is a transformation of government planning. It is a break from the past where departments worked in silos, where there was fruitless expenditure on irrelevant projects, a practice that was common, and where development was not aligned to the national objectives. Now, with the DDM, we have an opportunity to disrupt the very bad ways in which we were working. Now, once this model is fully institutionalized, it will result in better use of resources, targeted development, and responsive planning. It will also help us to have a microscopic look at our local government challenges. Challenges that we're now beginning to address together with the Auditor General, who has informed us that that's where the real challenge is for us. It will enable districts and municipalities to develop, but also harness existing local economic initiatives such as the special economic zones, industrial parks, and agri hubs as well. Some of the honorable members mentioned some of these yesterday. We have set ourselves the target of rolling out the district development model in all 52 of the country's districts, as well as our metros. And we will be proceeding with this. Honorable members, as we proceed, it goes without saying that rebuilding state institutional capacity is transformative by its very nature. It was this presidency that instituted high-level commissions of inquiry into the workings of SARS and the NPA. Credibility has been restored to these institutions as they implemented the recommendations of the respective con commissions. By way of example, last year's financial year, SARS collected a record revenue of 1.5 trillion. Four years since I appointed a commission of inquiry into administration and governance at SARS, its turnaround has been spectacular. This revenue enables the state to fund social support, social infrastructure, and many other projects. These are the fruits of the reform process that we have undertaken. The Honorable Sheikh Imam has called on us to deal decisively with corruption at local government level, and we agree with him. I'm pleased to report that the work of the SAPS Clean Auditors team is ongoing and has seen a number of arrests for fraud and corruption at local government level. As a presidency, another focus for this year is supporting the respective departments to implement the recommendations of a number of high-level commissions appointed by the president. Now, Honorable Grunewald yesterday spoke about a number of SIU reports whose recommendations have not been implemented. And these are going to be followed, and we will make sure that recommendations that are made also by the SIU, and he mentions 464 of them, will also be followed up. As I indicated yesterday, a number of recommendations by the expert panel into the 2021 July unrest have already been implemented, and that process is ongoing. Notably, restoring stability in the leadership of the State Security Agency and the South African Police Service, as well as crime intelligence. That has proceeded in tandem, and we are beginning to see some good results. Yesterday, Deputy President also outlined the considerable progress that has been made in implementing the recommendations of the Advisory Panel on Land Reform and Agriculture a matter which Honorable Nyoncho also raised, not only about land, of course he raised the issue of military veterans. The Deputy President is addressing that at my instance, and he reports to me about the progress, and we must repeat that 
we hold, we hold the contribution that military veterans have made to the democracy that we today enjoy because they played an important role and these were men and women who were prepared to sacrifice life, limb and everything else. So that process of looking after our military veterans is ongoing and we will make sure that we address the various issues that are a challenge to their lives. Accountability is the cornerstone of any transformative vision if it is to be realized. No more critical is this than in the fight against corruption. A number of speakers have drawn attention to the fact that departments are often slow in following up on the implementation of recommendations. And this, as I said on the SIU report, as Honorable Khurneval said, is going to be followed up. As I said yesterday, the presidency will be ensuring that recommendations will be acted on. We will furthermore continue to lend support and wait to the highest office in the land to work to the work of the multidisciplinary offices that we have set up. For instance, the Fusion Center, the Hawks, the SAPS, and the NPA Investigating Directorate, and all other entities that are involved in the war against crime. And we will soon be making an announcement on the anti-corruption advisory body that we announced we would be setting up. Now, Honorable Hunewald once again has called on government to focus on strengthening the criminal justice system to deal decisively with all forms of criminality that impacts on people's daily lives. This begins fundamentally with improving policing, as he has often said. The re-establishment of the CPS, the entry of new police recruits, the strengthening of public order policing will further be strengthened and making sure that the job that the South African police has to do that is tough is supported as much as possible because they do a thankless task for the most part. Our task is a formidable one, but I have no doubt we are gaining ground. Our economic recovery is gathering pace. The health recovery from the pandemic is proceeding. We are steadily rebuilding the capacity of the state, which we've often said was really compromised and almost destroyed during state capture times. As the Minister of Justice and Correctional Services told this house yesterday, our law enforcement agencies are crawling back on malfeasance and corruption and are doing so without fear, favor, or prejudice. Now, despite our many challenges, we are some way off from the South Africa that we were a year, two years, or even three years ago. When COVID-19 struck in early 2020, there were many who believed we would collapse under the heavy weight of this burden. And yet we pulled through, having been able to mitigate the health impact and provide social support to the most vulnerable in our country. Possibly in the most outstanding way than any other country on our continent. The recovery that was promised is slowly coming to pass. Factories are back in full production, and new ones are being opened. Small businesses and local economies are being revitalized, and jobs are beginning to be created. And that is the important part that we should look at. Domestic and international investment is picking up. Many never thought that we would ever reach that one trillion rand investment target that I put. We're almost there. Public-private partnerships are being forged to close developmental logs, legs rather, and to grow the economy. So today, we again must prove the naysayers wrong. 
as we confront the economic and social challenges of the day that we are living in. We can also do so if we work together and we can also do so if we join hands. Now, addressing some of the specific issues that were raised, it pained my heart to hear Prince Mangosutu Butelezi outlining the interaction or some of the things that were uh, said uh, by a premier of a province. Now, I'm going to be talking to Prince Butelezi to see if there can be a good rapprochement between the two of them. I think that is important. It is important that we should do so. It really pained me when I heard him articulating this. Honorable Chabalala raised the issue of ESCOM, particularly in relation to switching of the lights in Soweto. Now that too I would want to follow up because we need to find out why it could have happened, whether they had deep consultations or not. Honorable Hunewald, I told him before he left, he raised the issue of the African style monument. And I said from what I had heard from Minister Mtetua, that was not the case. But he has said that he wants to have a further discussion with me on this matter. And honorable members, it has been a spirited and lively debate on the key issues that have to do with the lives of our people. And there have been many robust views that were put forward. We are grateful for this barometer of the health of our democracy. At the same time, let us remain focused. Let us put our heads together on how best we support the work that we are doing and indeed work together during the life of this entire administration. A well-capacitated, strategically oriented presidency driven by a long-term transformative vision is in all our best interest. For every few civil servants who are guided by self-interest, the vast majority are dedicated, ethical, and committed to their work. They are the men and the women who work each day tirelessly to serve our people in government, in hospitals, in police stations, and in our schools. They are the lifeblood of our country. I would like to express my gratitude to you all as members of parliament, members of this assembly, on my behalf and on behalf of the state that I lead for the tireless work that you all are doing in representing our people. And many of our people sometimes don't really know and understand the heavy burden that rests on your shoulders. They just don't understand. Many of you have to leave your homes from all over the country. Come and work here in Cape Town, work day in and day out. You run two households. You have a home from wherever you've come and you have a home here. When I became, <laughs> When I became a member of parliament, I realized that I had left my family in Johannesburg mm -hmm. and I was here. When I bought bread, I bought two loaves of bread. When I bought a TV set, I had to buy two. Everything was duplicated and it bears a heavy burden on yourselves, on your livelihood, on your social life, but also financially. I know and many people don't understand this. They think as members of parliament that you're all fat cats. And that's hardly the case. Hardly the case. So I'm, I'm giving, yeah, please say it was a joke. <laughs> so I'd like to thank you on behalf of the people of South Africa for the excellent work that you do. You pass our laws. We impose heavy burdens on all of you and the intellectual capacity that you put in the work that you do is to be commended. So thank you very much on behalf of the nation. I thank you. But I'd like... I'm not great. I'm not great. We are. 
I would also like to thank the Deputy President for his support and for the excellent manner in which we have both been executing the tasks that we were given by our people. The DP has taken on a lot more tasks, enabling our office to be more effective and efficient in tackling important matters that should lead to the improvement of our people's lives. When I'm not able to handle certain matters that were traditional leaders and so on, he comes into the breach and assists. So I thank him. I would also like to thank ministers who are in the presidency, Minister Nkwana Mashabane, Minister Gungubele, and Deputy Minister Skotwa, Kekana, Siweya, who are deployed in the presidency for their continued dedication to serve our people in their various tasks. So thank you very much. I also want to thank the Director General of the government and the Cabinet Secretary for the brave manner in which she has performed her duties, as well as Director General, as well in the office. The team in the presidency are the unsung heroes of our work that is being done to move our country forward. I also wish to thank the staff in the presidency, the staff in my private office, and those in the DP's private office for continuing to support us and making it a lot easier for us to do our work. And this includes our respective advisors. So, honorable members, <laughs> yes, and our two parliamentary councillors, of course. <laughs> And we, we really thank them because they keep us in touch with what is happening here in Parliament, much as we are not often here. So, the, well, no, 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 not only the chief whip of, 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 of the governing party, the chief whip of opposition as well. They, they do a magnificent job, and that is the sisterhood that sits here at the t head of the table. So, honorable members, for me, and the brothers as well. For me, this, this has been a meaningful debate disrupt, uh, dis, uh, despite everything else that happened around it, which is unfortunate, which is, in my view, totally unacceptable, because we do need to rely on the due processes we have. Even as we have differences, we should rely on the processes mm -hmm of our democracy to unfold, to handle problems, whatever problems we may have, whether they touch on the president or whoever, they are processes that need to be followed. So honorable members, let us get back to work. Let us ensure that we leave no one behind and enrich the democracy of our country. Thank you very much. Long live the president! Thank you. I thank you, the honorable, the president. Thank you to the speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.